This podcast is brought to you by Steinberg, creators of the VST Protocol and the award-winning Cubase Digital Audio Workstation. At Steinberg, we put creativity first. Learn more at steinberg.net. Hey, it's Larry Crane. Welcome to the Tape Op Podcast. Michael Beinhardt's name has graced some of popular music's seminal recordings, including Herbie Hancock's Future Shock and Soundgarden's Super Unknown. He is a musician and producer, author of Unlocking Creativity, a producer's guide to making music and art, and most recently has launched a service for artists and bands that focuses solely on pre-production. Online publisher Jeff Stanfield caught up with Michael from his home in Los Angeles to learn more. Enjoy. So tell me about your your new venture. You're offering uh, pre-production services. Yeah, well, uh, I I made a a very kind of uh, a very disturbing discovery <laughs> over the past um, ten years, and the discovery seems to be that very few people in bands know what pre-production is. And not as many produ- record producers as you would think seem to be performing it on records that they're working on. And uh, I have noticed that over the, I don't know, like for a pretty long period of time now, the quality of music that people are making is getting is is not getting better. Uh, it's it's not it's not improving. <laughs> and when I kind of put that together with the fact that less and less people are actually taking time to prep records before they go in and record them, it just occurred to me maybe people aren't spending as much time with this as they should. And I I felt, well, as someone who likes to feel responsible about this kind of stuff, that it it would be nice to provide this as a service for people, as a sort of standalone thing, so that they could have the opportunity to to do this and experience all the wonderful things that you as an artist experience when you're when you deal with pre-production you know like there's a there's actually a degree of artistic development that happens when uh when an artist is able to do pre-production they they actually grow organically you know because they're being forced to look at their music from a completely different perspective one that they wouldn't be able to take on their own because how objective can you really be about your own music, right? So, um, you know, you're, you're kind of forced in a sense to grow organically in that way. And, uh, you know, I, I think that this, that's an important component in being able to help popular music um, develop on its own, so to speak. So, yeah, so that, 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 that's really kind of what, what initially inspired it. How often on projects that you're asked to do is that whole process just being overlooked? Um, I, I, I've really been surprised over the past, um, yeah, I guess like 10 years, five, 10 years. Fewer people have really considered it at all. And, um, I've worked on several records where the recording process was really considered as a um, may, well, I guess I guess making a physical recording period was considered as kind of a peripheral to getting out and touring because the touring uh, aspect of the process is really where the artists make most of their money or think they're making most of their money. So the record is kind of like, oh, we've got some new material we're going to play for you kind of thing to justify their reasoning for going out and playing more shows. But they don't, but they're seeing it less and less as kind of like a, oh, this is our opportunity to kind of like create like the milestone marker of where we are creatively. It's like, oh no, this is just more content that we get to lob at people when we're performing night after night. And it's like, wait a second. Isn't, isn't this a case of the tail wagging the dog? This is kind of ass backwards here. Like, you know, aren't we supposed to make these wonderful recordings that really kind of 
that, that demarcate your creative development. And, you know, the touring is just sort of like part of all that, that you're sort of taking it out there and, and showing it off. Like, uh, I, I, I just, I, I couldn't really understand that. And, and, and then seeing artists who have written a bunch of songs and don't, and, and go like, okay, here are songs that we're going to record. So let's go in and record them. And I, I, I go like, well, wait a sec. Do you, have you taken any, have you set aside any time to actually prep these things? Like, are we going to, do we have time to sit down and analyze them and take them apart and see where they're not working as opposed to, as opposed to me blowing smoke up your ass and going like, oh, how great this is. These are wonderful songs, you know? And they, and they kind of like, they're puzzled by this. Like, well, no, we're just going to record them, right? And that to me is, that's a, that's a really sure way to kind of end your career or at very least stagnate very quickly because there's no growth. There's no potential for artistic growth at all. See what I'm saying? I know this is a sort of a tough question to answer because every band is different, but where are the areas that need to be worked the hardest when you're ripping down somebody's song? Um, it's, it's, it's the whole shebang, <laughs> really. Like when I'm looking at people's music and this happens with people who are actually really, really experienced too, because surprisingly I've discovered something else that there are quite a few artists who even after years and years of success and long, you know, a lot of longevity, haven't really had someone sitting there analyzing their music and helping them kind of get to the next level with it. Um, I'm surprised by how people are missing aspects of their arrangements. I mean, I, I, I shouldn't say that because a lot of these aspects are things that like, you know, that you, 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 you benefit from having an outside ear on, but nonetheless, it shows to me when I see these uh, come up on these things, you know, for people who are, who are, have had experience doing this and they're, and they're, they're absent or they're lacking. It's like, wow, you really haven't had anyone just helping you with this, you know, or helping or, or helping you look at the song and go like, I think you really need to see, you know, for example, like how a bass drum pattern reinforces a vocal phrase, you know, how root notes are working with, you know, with chords and with melodies on top and top lines, how bass guitar and, and uh, drum patterns are working together. Um, you know, how strum patterns on a guitar are working with drum kit, song structure, dynamics, you know, all these things. And it, it's really surprising how people also get into this thing about, you know, they'll kind of cannibalize an old song that they have or that they like a section of that's, you know, the song itself is not working, but they like the part. And they just sort of like jam it into another song and kind of like they sort of make it work. You know, okay, well, this is the right key change, or if I transpose it, it'll be the right key change, you know, and I think that this is working. And it's amazing how the, you know, how the idea of putting it in the song was actually better than the actual execution. It's, it's just, it's stuff like that, you know, song flow, lyrics, it, it just goes on and on and on, you know, but these are things that really have to be explored and examined in order for the artist to have better songs. Right. You're somebody that made records where there was big budgets, and now you're somebody that's making records where there are typically much <laughs> smaller budgets. I mean, I know yeah. big, big budgets still exist, but how are you, how are you allocating that time uh, and how much of that time is, is dedicated to pre-production and, and, and what's, the, what's the value of that to you as the producer? Um, well... At the moment, I'm really focusing almost exclusively on doing pre-production. Um, I, I discovered something <laughs> about myself and over, over the years, and that's that I don't like working with people. I, I, don't like wor I don't like the idea of working where there are people kind of like standing over me, kind of like tapping my, t tapping their feet going, oh, okay, okay, let's go. Come on, come on. You know, and you got to do it this way. You got to do it that way. And it's like, all right, like the, the process of producing a record has become difficult enough. And, you know, I mean, obviously I have the luxury, I suppose, to be able to say things like this. I, you know, I don't know. 
I don't know many people who, who do, but, you know, fortunately I can, but like, I, it's, it's hard enough trying to be an artist in times such as these where you have to inject, you know, seriously inject logistics into the process to the point where the logistics kind of surpass any kind of artistry that you're going to inject into the work. Like, and then you're going to try and make the job even harder on top of that because I have to do so many different functions on the record. Like, this is not right. This is one of the things that contributes to making music much less appealing than it has been previously. The fact that we have to work our asses off to try and come up with something. We're not even given time to work with the artists to make their songs better. We just have to rush and record everything and kind of balance our, you know, just worry about balancing our budgets and, you know, and, and, and hoarding our pennies on, on their behalf and, and kind of allocating what goes where, like scrupulously, in, you know, intensely. And, and there's so much stress involved in the process now. I mean, not that there wasn't before, but the stressors were, were different. You know, when you're dealing with artists who are, you know, where you, you don't have the material that you need from them yet, but you know that you have time to be able to work and get that out. Or there's a psychological block that's taking place. Now those things are irrelevant. You know, get it, it used to be that getting past that stuff was the stuff that really kind of brought you to the place of where you could say, okay, I've got this record now. This is going to be really something. This is really going to be something special. Now it's now it's basically about getting done. That is the key, getting done. So to me, like I can spend a lot of time, like months, with an artist helping them do pre-production. And my end of things is not terribly time consumptive, although it is very intensive because I'm listening very closely to their music. But it puts me in a position where I feel that I can where, where I can cost them less money and deliver them a much higher quality product. And in the end, they can allocate the money that they need for producing the record in the right way, instead of hiring me to produce the whole thing, which is going to cost them more money, you know, because as you said, yes, I need to eat, <laughs> you know, I, you know, I mean, and working like this, if you, you know, the records that we're talking about from, from times gone by, you know, they, they, they were like, you know, three months, four months, seven months, in, in, in one case, like 14, 15 months, you know, you, you have massive amounts of money and you have lots of time in which to work. You know, no one's breathing down your neck. Um, and this just isn't going to happen now. Um, also, like recording companies, like quarterly earnings profits, if you're de certainly if you're dealing with a major, that stuff comes into play. So if you're working with a larger artist, you know, you have to get it out in, you know, by a certain quarter or else they're going to go crazy on you and, you and their shareholders are going to get pissed off at them and go like, why isn't it, you know, what happened to my, my dividends check, you know? <laughs> you know, so you're dealing with all these like arbitrary things that have absolutely nothing to do with making a record at all. But somehow you have to be responsible for this, you know. And again, that leads to nothing more than an inferior product. My, my concern at this point, my only concern is to try and create a superior product, even under the most difficult of conditions. And that's really why I've come to the place that I'm at right now. Where did you learn the value of pre-production? I mean, where did that come from for you? Um, it, it, it was kind of a gradual thing. It wasn't anything that I, um, set out to do in the same way. I didn't really set out to be a producer. It's just, it's just, uh, it's just knowledge that started to accumulate or an awareness, I guess, that started to accumulate. I mean, I wasn't particularly, uh, incredibly savvy as far as, um, music theory and stuff like that. I just started to notice that there were certain aspects of the form and structure of popular music that um, I guess played an important role in its listenability, in how interesting it is to a listener. Um, I mean, apart from the fact that you obviously want to have an amazing song to start with, um, but in the absence of that, um, 
it's very, very important to have things that are that that kind of re, that reinforce the structural integrity of a piece of music, and keep it interesting to a listener, even if it's not, uh, you know, a masterpiece. Uh, and those things, they just they became more apparent over time. And it was definitely a learning process, and you know, at one point or another, I just I kind of had to go back and go, this this is very interesting, and I started to kind of make notes on it, and. Those notes eventually became a book, and I've expanded on that even more. But like it's, you know, I, I obviously the the work speaks for itself. Also, every I'd say from the yeah from the late '80s on, every record I did really kind of really consisted of this um, idea of of doing a lot of preliminary work. It's like insurance or creating a foundation for a house. You know, it's like. You build a beautiful house on a rickety foundation. It's not going to matter how nice the house looked, you know. <laughs> yeah. Agreed. Can you walk me through from a past record that you've done? Maybe walk us through some of the things that you you did in pre-production to make that record better. Soundgarden or whatever. I mean, you got some really amazing songs. You've got a great band. You got a great singer. But obviously, a lot of work went into that early. What what was that work like? Well, um, I have to say, from my end, as far as arrangement, um, I, I had abs- I had virtually no input on that record arrangement-wise. Um, however, uh, if if we had if they'd done the record with a different producer, um, that entire the record that you know would be completely different. Um, a lot of the songs that are on there wouldn't exist, including many of the best ones. Um, and that was because when we started the record, they sent me a tape of, um, of what they were planning on releasing. And most of it was not, it wasn't up to the, up to par with what I think the record everyone else had envisioned was going to be. And I had to put that to them, you know, which was, which is not the most pleasant conversation to have. Um, and from there it was, it was two months of, of hard work and it included some soul searching and a couple of really intense conversations with Chris about the process. Um, you know, but this is also, this is also part of that preliminary process, being able to go to the artist and say, this is not working and here's why to be able to explain it properly. See, in that case, the artist was strong enough to be and and, ta- and talented enough to be able to take the the information he was getting and just kind of run with it and deliver something. Although what he delivered in the end was far it far exceeded anything that I could have possibly imagined. You know, I didn't know that after I had a conversation with Chris, where we really talked about what kind of songs he he, he had to write, that you know, two and a half weeks later, I was going to get a tape that had fell on Black Days and Black Hole Sun on it. <laughs> you know that was that was that was that was something um but when i work with corn um you know it was kind of a similar situation because i they sent me a cd with a bunch of songs on it and actually 40 ideas and out of those 40 ideas two were actually completed with but with with no vocals or vocal melodies on them at all and the rest of them were just jams and out of everything on that CD, which was well over an hour, um, I think we used, we used like a couple of bars of one part. Everything else was constructed, uh, from the point that we began rehearsals. And, you know, I, I, I had to actually take stock of the situation and see how they were performing out here in California where they were dealing with so many, uh, inter- so much interference. And I finally said to them, look, guys, we're not getting any work done because you're constantly interrupted. Your attention spans are wandering. We have to go somewhere else. And so we wound up going to Arizona, which, as I found out later, was also (laughs) kind of rough because um, there were a lot of distractions there. But at least they were away from a lot of the things that were really driving themselves, that were driving them crazy. And we were able to focus. And what that pre-production consisted of was me basically sitting in a small room with them with with tiny amps and an electronic drum kit and and building up song structures literally from the ground up um you know it was and that was a really long and arduous process but you know 
when you when you do this kind of work, it's the artists are different, the situations are different, the individuals, you know, as in as individual people, they're different too. And f from my point of view, I have to take stock of the situation and see and see figure out how to optimize it to get the best result possible. That's what it's about. I mean, it sounds in that situation like you're the facilitator and the babysitter to some degree if they're if you're really trying to just keep them on point. Uh, yeah. I mean, obviously that's part of the role, I guess, too. I mean, your job, um, when I hear that, I think that, well, you're you're producing the record. You're not just doing pre-production, <laughs> you know? Well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, it's a... Uh... Yeah, I mean, you're. I, I was. I was face to face with them constantly doing pre-production. Now it's a different story because I can do it remotely, um, you know. But again, that's a circumstance where people did have the kind of budget that enabled us to work that way, um, you know. And and also at that point, I was dealing with an artist that were like that were pretty far along in their career, you know. They were in a position, I think, where. It was, I'm not going to say it was harder for them to feel motivated, but it was, it was the type of thing where they didn't, they, they didn't have to do this. You know, they could have rested on their laurels for the rest of their lives and probably done okay, but still they, they professed ambition. They, they actually wanted to do something that would be able to create a continuum in their career and, you know, I'm, I'm having a mission statement like that to preface a record, um, especially with an artist like that, like you're, you're sort of honor and duty bound to to create something that's going to be very special for and with them. So, you know, I just kind of I did what I had to do. And yeah, that that, that definitely involved a lot of what you described. Um, just going back to uh, uh, Chris Cornell and Soundgarden, um, when you initially heard the, the music, well, I mean, what was that conversation like to telling them this isn't this isn't as good as it can be? Um, I can't I don't recall exactly. Uh, but I I do. I do know that I was a little worried. <laughs> I was a little worried um, because uh, I didn't really like anything that I heard on there. I mean, it, it all kind of it, it all kind of left me a little cold, uh, and even though um, the song "Spoon Man" was on there, which was the first single off the record, um, I was still like, "Is this the best that they got?" You know, and I knew that I had to that I had to speak with them about it, uh, and I don't remember how how exactly the conversation went. But I made it very clear to them that we couldn't start recording until we had the right material. And that are, that immediately put me on thin ice with them because that's not a thing that you really want to say to an artist, especially at that level. Um, and, you know, and, and I guess be able to maintain a, a, like a, <laughs> a civil relationship with them. But... Sometimes you just have to put that kind of stuff aside and go like, well, what's best for the, you know, for the, for this artist's career, you know, and, and the, re the potential record that we're going to make my, my relationship with them or, or, or the fact that they need to hear the truth about this, because this could be the difference between them making a great artistic statement and not having a career at all. I mean, have you ever had that a situation where that backfired and they just, they, they just fired you? Um, Fortunately, not. No, um, nothing like that's happened. I think it's. I mean, on that on that record, I feel that it it, it came dangerously close. But uh, but no, no. I I, <laughs> I I've learned that if that if you're going to present people with uh, with <laughs> statements that contain such gravity, that it's also good to do it as diplomatically as possible. And so on a project like that with that, I mean, you, you sort of already agreed to do the, to do the record. Um, and then you're hearing the music. I know a lot of people get sent music and then sort of decide, well, I don't think this is for me or yes or no. Um, but you were obviously hired and, and brought into the process super early. Well, um, 
at that point in their career, um, Soundgarden were pretty highly regarded. Um, so it was one of those things that I think a lot of producers would see as kind of like a notch in their belt. And um, my understanding before I got the project was that um, they were kind of, they were in preliminary talk, talks with Rick Rubin and that he more or less was going to do the record anyway. Uh, so this was one of those things where someone said, oh, you should go up and meet with those guys anyhow, you know, because Rick doesn't have the record for sure. And I went up and I met with them and it, it was one of those things where, where it was like, no, I think this is, this is going to work out to be a very good project if it's done well. Um, so it was a bit of a gamble. It was that it was kind of like a calculated risk, um, but it's one of those things where you, at that point in history too, like you were kind of able to um, plot the trajectory, the potential traje trajectory of artists like those, and everyone sort of in in the music industry sort of looked at Sound at Soundgarden as being like the next big rock band. All they had to do was have a really significant record which hadn't been created at that point, but that was all they needed to do. And, and uh, their success was pretty much guaranteed. So that's kind of how I went into it, really. I was like, we're going to have to make a great record somehow. I don't know what, how, but it's going to have to happen. And, uh, you know, uh, it was the, that, that was also, that was my mission, and, but it was also my challenge. So, you know, it was, I, I, I think people just, everyone saw that as being a, a poten potentially a great opportunity. I mean, for example, that's, that's why I think Rick was, you know, had met with them already too. Right. Cause it was inevitable. It seemed, well, you know, I mean, back then people, you could say things like that, you know, I, um, it, it was funny though, cause hearing the demos after, um, uh, after we met, I was like, whoa, boy, <laughs> we got a lot of work ahead of us. Are they, were the band, you know, are they, are they willing to do that work? And what was that work like? Um, well, it was, it, it, it took two months. It was, it was, I think it was a lot of hard work. It, it consisted of me waiting for demos, coming out there a few times. Um, I know some of the guys in the band uh, from at that point were kind of were a little were dismissive <laughs> of of me being there because uh, they weren't really used to having a producer being quite so hands on or being directly involved or even wanting to you know comment on what they were doing. I think it was it was kind of like hey you know we'll we'll handle our shit you handle yours kind of thing. Um, but I. I encourage them all to participate in the writing process. I, I noticed that that Matt had already written songs. I knew that Kim was writing, and that um, that Ben really he that he had a really unusual approach to songwriting. And I felt like what he did would really it would round the record out in a really really good way. And I just I, I felt that it was important for them all to contribute. So I, encur I actively encouraged them and I, I just spoke with them regularly and, you know, Chris would send me demos. I, I, get, I think I'd get a demo like every three, four weeks or something like that. Um, and, you know, once in a while I'd get a really good song and a lot of what he was sending me was kind of, was sort of like, eh. Um, but then at one point, about uh, a month and a half in, I got a demo with like 11 songs on it and from Chris and I listened to it and not one of those songs was like something that I would want to have on this record that would that I felt would be ideal for them and that made me sit back and go like okay I really have to have a talk with this guy because he's it seems like at that point he's going off the rails a little bit um you know because the, these they they really kind of they felt they, they felt kind of stale to be, you know, to, to be perfectly honest. And for someone as talented as Chris, that's just not acceptable. Uh, and that's really where this, this one conversation came from, which, which yielded from what I could tell Black Hole Sun, because we spoke very directly about what he was going to work on next, you know, what kind of music it was going to be. And it really came down to like, he felt that he had to write songs 
that would be that, that Soundgarden fans would would find appealing, which explained a lot to me about why things were sounding so stale. I said to him, "Look, don't worry about these people. They're going to love what you do if it's if it's has conviction, if it's got you in it. You know, write songs that you love to write. Write songs that write music that appeals to you, that that speaks to you, that you feel you're speaking through. You know, and I think that concept was a little foreign to him because he really hadn't put himself in that state of mind. Um, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know how long. Maybe never, but." probably at some point, but not, not recently. Uh, and, you know, I asked him what type of music he liked and he told me and he said, well, write, write songs like that, you know? Yeah. And he said, but what if it doesn't sound like Soundgarden? I was like, don't worry about that. When your band play it as a band, you will make it Soundgarden. It'll be Soundgarden. So it won't matter what it sounds like, you know? And he, he <laughs> he went off and he created he created brilliance in my opinion like when i got that demo tape uh black hole sun was the last song on the tape everything on it was good I, everything on it was great we didn't use two of the songs that were on it um we actually recorded one of them it, we didn't wind up using that i wish we had but they put it on the on the next record it was called tighter and tighter and uh it was Fell on Black Days, another song that he did with, with, with Jerry Cantrell playing on it. Tighter and Tighter and Black Hole Sun. I heard Black Hole Sun, I played it 15 times in a row. I was From the very first arpeggios, I was like, what in God's name is this? It was amazing. I, I just, I was stunned beyond belief. And I called him up and I was like, you're a genius. This is amazing. We can make a record now. Thank you. <laughs> and he was, he was really surprised. He was like, really? I was like, "Kiss, really? It's incredible what you did." <laughs> he he kind of he was sort of incredulous, which I couldn't understand because I I was like, "Not only is this one of the best songs I've ever heard, it's one of the it's one of the handful of best songs that I've ever been presented to produce." Like, thank you, you know, this is this is magnificent. <laughs> oh, that's great. Well, um, yeah. So, where can we? Uh, where can people find? Uh, more information on your pre-production services offerings I am on michaelbeinhorn.com it's easy enough that's easy well yeah, man. well, thanks for your time today it was fun to chat my pleasure thank you thanks for listening find us online at tapebop.com facebook twitter and instagram until next time <laughs>